We are on page 35 of the manual. We're working with the principle of, of, of exploitation. The principle of exploitation. First off, I'll give you the definition. It is follow up and follow through vigorously on a breakthrough or advantage once it is achieved. So the principle of exploitation is to follow up and follow through vigorously on a breakthrough or advantage once it is achieved. Now, <clears throat> for instance, if we do these meetings and once we're finished, then we would want to follow up and follow through on what has been achieved here. One of the ways to do that is through, as, as this is um, organizing in this area at this point, and we're getting better organized here, then one of the things, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later on, but we would start to put out a call for people that want to be involved in life teams and <clears throat> wanting to be involved in healing rooms and you know working in the healing rooms and that kind of thing. And so to follow up and follow through would be to start by taking names of people that want to, either if you're not involved in a life team, you want to get involved. So we'd want to find out that. And then once this is over, then the, the leadership here would follow up with those names and put them in place and work them in and then everything start working through. So that would be one example. Now, exploitation means that when you have delivered a telling blow to the enemy, you finish it. You do not back off. You continue to attack until the enemy is absolutely destroyed. Now, people say, but that sounds so mean and that sounds so aggressive. And Okay, Jesus said that he came to destroy the works of the enemy. Right? That means, now, if you look up the word destroy, it means literally to ground to powder. That's what it means. To grind something down to powder. In other words, once it is destroyed, see, <clears throat> to destroy something means to make it so that it can never be, it can never come back. Simple as that. That's why, well, I, you can just see this principle all through the Old Testament. All through the Old Testament. You saw it with Sodom and Gomorrah. See, that's why when people say, oh, but look at, you know, Katrina was a judgment of God against New Orleans. I said, if that's true, then God's gotten old. And, he, you know, he's near sad or something now because he missed. Right? Because Bourbon Street was still left almost untouched. And so, you know, the, almost all of, you know, there was parts of New Orleans that were destroyed, but hardly any of the bad parts. So, it was amazing for these people to be saying all these things. And yet, whenever God destroyed a city, you don't hear of it anymore. Right? I mean, it is done. Right? And so, for people to say that, first off, you need to go back and check your history. God has not weakened. And the only thing is that, is that now, <clears throat> whenever Jesus had his disciples, and they said, Lord, you know, that city didn't re receive you. You want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? And he said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Well, I would say that to those preachers that tried to say that that was the judgment of God. You don't know what spirit you're of. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Right? So our spirit should be to save and not to destroy. Now, meaning men's lives. Now, the works of the devil, we are to destroy. Right? But not men's lives. The reason we're destroying the works of the devil is so that we can set men's lives free. So, <clears throat> victory belongs to the most persevering. Of course, that was Napoleon Bonaparte that said that. But let me give it to you in biblical terms. To him that overcometh. And he that endures to the end. Those are biblical terms with the same intent of what Napoleon said. Victory belongs to the most persevering. If you continue, that's the key. Never give up. No matter what, just keep on going. Throughout history, great battles have been won and then lost because of the failure of a commanding officer to follow through and complete the victory. I can give you all kinds of examples. Modern warfare, civil war, World War II, ancient wars, over and over again. A commander would win a telling victory, but then would not follow through. Matter of fact, Alexander the Great is a good example of that. 
at the, uh, what was it, what battle? Yeah, was it Galgamea? Should have looked it up, I guess, before I try to quote it. Uh, it was where he beat the, um, well, it's where he beat uh, King Darius. And Darius left the field. And instead of chasing him, he let him escape. And it ended up costing him later on. He should have finished it. Should have followed him at the time. And that's what you see throughout the Old Testament over and over again. When God sent an army in to fight, he said, you destroy them all. Isn't that right? right. Absolutely destroy them. So the principle is there. Now today, our enemy is not flesh and blood. Right? So we're not killing people. We are destroying the works of the enemy. But you have to destroy them completely. And just like he told the, Egypt, told the Israelites about the Egyptians, he said, the Egyptians you see, you will never see again. That's how you can tell it's God. God finishes what he starts. Right? That's the same way it should be with us. It, we should be the people so that we start to establish the kingdom of God on this earth with force to the point where whenever you close down a situation, it does not come back. That's like I said earlier. You close down a store or a business, but then you also have to work through the Spirit to enact legislation so that it would stop it from coming back in. And or you can cause such a revival in the city that the thing has no patrons. Right? That's the two. And I'm not saying you have to do either or. You can do both. We've had a lot of talk recently in the last years about this revival, that revival. True revival doesn't just affect the church. True revival affects the community. And if it doesn't affect the community, it's not true revival. All right? You go back to Charles Finney, when Finney went into various cities around, up around New York and those areas, the entire city was changed. <clears throat> the bar owners, the saloon owners, would take their kegs out in the street and pour it down the gutters, all the alcohol. And all the churches, I mean all the uh, beer halls and saloons and things, were turned into churches and prayer meetings. See, that's the way it's... I, like I said when we were up at Cheyenne that time, I, I said, go in and take over a, a place that was a, you know, a, a bar or a liquor store or you know, a porno place or something like that. Take it over. And don't change any of the signs. Leave the signs what they were. Because the people that hadn't heard about it being closed down will walk in while you're having service. And that's called the element of surprise. Okay? <laughs> so... <laughs> so. And I promise you, you will be free of all religious people. Because they will not walk in there. Okay? <laughs> okay? <laughs> Bad part is, when the religious people are sitting there, and the guy that walks in goes, Hey! Yeah. Okay, anyway, moving on. <laughs> moving right along. <laughs> So, a thousand jokes come to mind. I just, we just could go off of that for a while, but we won't. We'll stick for the program here. <laughs> Point B, the enemy's use of the principle of exploitation. The enemy's use of the principle of exploitation in individual combat. In individual combat, the enemy will use a probing attack to find your area of weakness, and then he will begin to find ways to bring that weakness up at every opportunity. In the area of sin, the enemy will find your preferred sin, and manipulate situations to bring temptation before you, trying to get you to fall to that sin. Once the temptation has been acted upon, the enemy will begin drawing you in more and more. Okay? Sin is never satisfied. <clears throat> this is exploiting... Yeah, this is exploiting an advantage. This is... Knock that D off there. It should be exploiting an advantage, not an advantage. This is where the Christian should be employing the principle of security by building up strong defenses in the areas of your weaknesses. Another area this principle works in the individual Christian's life is in fear. The enemy will find what, you're, what you are, should be afraid of, what? <laughs> what you're unaware of and therefore fear. There, okay, it's right. Sorry, that I wrote it wrong. The enemy will find what you are uh, unaware of and therefore fear because you fear what you're unaware of. Okay? 
that the unknown is what most people fear the most. <clears throat> therefore, and you therefore fear. Then through a series of events, the enemy will stir up the fear until you develop faith for what you fear to happen. You keep letting little things happen, and every little time you fear, he builds faith in you for fear. Remember, fear is an anointing to do what the enemy wants you to do. It is a satanic anointing. Fear is an anointing to disobey God. Now look at the enemy's use of the principle of exploitation in corporate warfare. This principle utilized in a church situation would be called the domino effect. A wrong doctrine or a perceived wrong in a church is one of the fastest spreading usages of this principle. A rumor will spread quickly throughout a church and is in actuality one of the enemy's most effective tools. Many times the enemy uses the principle of exploitation by causing a simple problem in a leader and the exploiting and then exploiting the situation by spreading the knowledge of the problem throughout the church. Many times this happens even after the leader has repented of the problem. The rumor will continue. Now, the main thing I'm trying to show you here is that the enemy will set something up and then when you fall for it, he will exploit you falling for it. And what he does, see, you fall, he could care less what you do. The enemy could care less. He, what he is interested in, two things. Your effectiveness in the kingdom of God and your influence in the kingdom of God. If you are effective in the kingdom of God and if you have great influence in the kingdom of God, then what he will do is he will set you up and hope that you bite, so to speak, so that then whenever you fall, first off, as soon as you sin, your effectiveness is stopped. Secondly, as soon as the knowledge of your sin spreads, your influence is stopped. And by that, you can bring a lot more people down with you. That's what happened back in the 80s with some major ministries that those problems didn't start then. They've been going on for years. And the enemy waited until the, those ministries had gained such a prominence. He could have hit them at early on when they had less prominence. But he waits because it's more advantageous for him to wait so that then when he does bring them down and expose what's going on, then there's a lot more people affected. I don't know how many people told me how they fell after a particular well-known evangelist. And I told them, I said, well, that's because you had your eyes on a man and not on Jesus. So, but the devil relies on that, and people still do. Now, the Christian's use of the principle of exploitation in individual combat. The Christian should use the principle of exploitation in every battle. He must not become complacent. If you are ministering to someone, you must not back off of that situation until the victory is absolutely won. Now, that doesn't mean you have to stay there in their presence, but you do have to continue to go after it. Many times, apparent victory has been won. The enemy has backed off. Then the Christian relaxes, and suddenly there's a counterattack that kills the person. But it's because they relaxed and backed off. So, this is not right. It is not acceptable. You fight until the opponent surrenders, and his base of operations is destroyed. Now, if, if you're going to minister to people, then you obviously, well, I can tell you how to get a 100% success rate. It's easy. You take one person and you pray for them until they are well. And you don't pray for anybody else until they're well. Now, obviously, that's not the best case scenario because you're always around other sick people. But you work on, you totally focus on one person at a time and they are all that exist. And if you do that, generally, honestly, you know, you say, I can't do that. I mean, come on. You know why you're saying that? It's because you're used to having to pray for somebody for weeks. But when you focus all of your attention on one person and you go after that one problem they've got, generally, if that's all you do, I'm talking about, I mean, not even going to work. No, I'm, talking about, no, I'm talking about absolute focus. Breaking aside, fasting, praying, going after this thing, going after it strongly. Generally, it won't last three or four days. Because you are so focused on that thing and you blast it. And you're going after it and after it. And you literally just overwhelm this thing until it goes. Then you have to train the person 
the truth of the Word of God and that they are set free and that they can remain free and that the enemy has no right to come back upon them. Because otherwise, you're going to be praying for them over and over again. So first of it is get them free, but then you've got to teach them how to stay free. And you have to teach them that you, are, you may be their deliverer, but you're not their Savior. Right? You can deliver them, but then they have to turn their attention and their affection toward God, and they have to follow Him and be discipled by you for Him. Right? That's the way it works. Now, and then once you finish with that person, then you can go to another. But in, re in the real world, it doesn't generally work that way. In the real world, especially if you're getting any kind of results at all, you're going to be in such demand that you don't have, you don't have the luxury of praying for one person at a time. You have to do what's in front of you. And so you have to decide how much, and this goes back to the economy of force, how much attention you're going to give to this case at this time while you're still giving some attention to this case, and you have to start allocating. That's the best way. That's the only thing you can do. And I don't, you know, it may not sound right, but it's all you can do. One of the things that I learned early on, because I had told you before, if you've been to the DHT, there was a point where when I was praying for people that we were getting people healed, and, we, and it was, a lot of it was instant, a lot of it was, you know, progressive. And there got to a place where most of the cases I was praying for was terminal cases. I mean, we're talking 24 hours, that kind of thing. And it got to where when I finished praying with them or talking with them, and I went back home, I lay down at night to go to sleep, and I close my eyes, and there's their faces. These people, you know, the ones that I knew what they looked like. And I just see them. And I'd lay there for sometimes hours, just couldn't sleep. Not, and it wasn't, it wasn't that it, I was laying there saying, God, that one, you we got to have that one. We've got to get that one. In Jesus' name, you be here. And I, I'd still continue. And that went on and on. It got to a point where I literally, I almost had a nervous breakdown. Now, that isn't God's will. Right? Now, and, but I didn't know the principle that allowed me to do what needed to be done because, and this goes twofold because I actually had somebody working with me at that time, came to me and I was explaining to them, I'd just be walking along and just start shaking and crying and all this kind of stuff. And there were times when I was at Walmart and different places, I would start to shake and cry and have to go into the restroom and just stay there until it stopped. And I knew if I ever just gave myself to it, I knew they'd come in there hours later and I'd be sitting in the corner somewhere and just gone. And so I, I finally I told some people that were working with me and, one person said, Curry, that's, that's not God. And I said, I know, but I don't know what to do. They said, you've got to learn to cast your cares upon Jesus. He, you do all you can, but once you've done all you can, you've got to give it to him. And once I learned how to really let go, I, when I'm praying and ministering, I'm praying and ministering, and they're all that is. But when you finish, you have to disconnect. If you don't, they will go with you. See, when you're praying... If you're doing any good, you're praying in the Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean always in tongues, but I'm saying you're praying through the Spirit, out of the Spirit, and when you're doing that, life is going into them, and it's going into their spirit, not their flesh. And whenever your spirit connects with their spirit, if you don't disconnect, it'll stay connected. That's where some people get the idea of soul ties and that kind of stuff. And whenever you really care for people, and you really know they don't have to be sick, then there is a connection. And if you don't let go, you can connect with a hundred people. And pretty soon, you're carrying a hundred people with you. You say, that sounds crazy. That's why Elijah told his servant, didn't my spirit go with you whenever you went? That, why? Because there was a connection. They were, there was close contact to the point where they had a connection. And it got to where, it's just the same thing that happens with husbands and wives. You know, the husband can, you know, have an accident or something, and the wife know about it right when it happens. Why? Because there's a spiritual connection. And so, I, I've seen it with my mom and my dad. My dad would have a, he was a policeman, he'd have a wreck or something, and my mom would wake up and come get me and say, Curry, we got to pray, and she'd just be crying and praying and going, and 30 minutes later, we get a phone call, uh, your dad's been in a car wreck. And that was the first we heard of it, and it's like, man, we heard it from heaven before we ever heard it from the police. Why? Because they, they, there was a connection there, and plus my mom is a prayer warrior, and so she stays sensitive to the things of the Spirit, and so she would pick that stuff up real quick. See, there's a lot more to this than what the church really walks in or realizes sometimes. There's, there's more to the spirit realm. And so, whenever you make that connection, if you don't know how to break that connection, then that stays with you. And it's more than just thinking about it. They stay with you. And it got to where finally I was just, I was, I almost had a nervous breakdown. It was, 
you know, I almost would say I, I, I had one, at least maybe to some degree, because of what all was going on. There was situations where there were <clears throat> almost like blackouts, to where I just, it was like I was shutting down and just couldn't handle it and just started crying to God, God, what is this? Ain't right. And then he showed me how to disconnect. And, he, and then, then I started realizing you also have to decide, for lack of a better term, who you're going to invest time in. Because there, Satan will send people to overwhelm you time-wise. People who do nothing and they don't want anything. They don't really want, even want to be healed and they don't want anything, but they just, they will take up all of your time and never change. And you have to decide how much time you're going to invest in a person. Now, I know this sounds mean because you want to say, well, you should invest in everybody. Okay, that sounds good, but I can, if you say that, I can tell you, you ain't done it. Because you can't do it and remain effective. So you have, there's a lot of people out there that don't want help, but there's a lot of people that do. And I don't have time to waste on people that don't want help when there's so many people that do want help. And so you have to decide. Sometimes you help all that ask you, but at some point you have to decide, I've done what I can do, and then you start helping them in other ways. You, know? you start giving them books or CDs. Instead of you spending time with them, you give them a book and say, go read this. And when you finish, come back and we'll talk. And then when they come back, you listen to them. And, and you just work with them, but you don't invest a lot of time in them because you know by now that they're not going to change. Some people don't want it. Some people, some people don't want to be healed. Yeah, even the people that don't want to be healed, you can still get them healed, but you can't keep them healed. They're, it'll get right back. If it's not that, it'll be something else. And a lot of people, you know, you get them healed and all of a sudden they go into to depression because now they're not getting the attention they were before. Sounds crazy, but it's amazing. It's true. And our society has created people to be, have a victim mentality and be codependent. And they're looking for somebody to latch on to. And if you show any strength or any confidence or anything like that, they will latch on to you real quick and try to, to draw from that. And now, you should be giving it to them. But at the same time, it shouldn't be, they should be getting it and starting to walk in it and not just always, you know those, um, I almost said the name of them. They're those, they're little eels that if you have uh, sharks and things like that, that they, um, what do they call them? Well, no, it's elite. Well, that's, that's similar to it, but there's a, I almost said it. What is it? Yeah, but they, they actually snack on, uh, they snag on to uh, sharks and whales and things like that. Remoras, that's it. That's it. I kept, I kept trying to say, um, uh, that, that other kind that comes out and does the weird stuff, but <clears throat> I'm sure you, that's my definitions. You know, the ones that come out and do the weird stuff. That's the ones. You know. <laughs> After you get it past about like a thousand feet down, everything down there is weird. Okay, you know they got eyes on stems and all that kind of stuff, so it's all weird. After you get that far down, but <clears throat> these little remora, they will stick to these things and they live off of their host and their parasites essentially. There are a lot of Christians that will do the same thing. They will, they will latch on, and you, you can't run. I mean, you got to admit, we're all in a race, right? And you can't run as fast when people are doing that. God never said for you to do that for people. He, he told you to disciple them. That means they run their own race, right? You can't run the race for them. You can bear their burdens. If they cry, you cry with them, and, and you, when they laugh, you laugh. All that's true. But the whole point of doing that is that you're raising them up to a point where eventually they walk on their own. You're, you're not called to bear the weight of, a, of the whole world. You're not the Messiah, right? So you have to realize and then give it over to him because so, that'll, that'll come. It, it'll, you'll have that effect. So, okay, next. <clears throat> what are we at here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. From the connection? Yeah. It, it really, the only way that I learned to do it, I guess, because nobody tells you. I mean, you know, generally you don't hear about it. But the only way I learned to do it was just, I learned to pray, believe, and then at the end, give it to God, and then say, okay, it's yours. Now, I, if I hear about it again, I'll pray again. But there's a difference between getting in too deep. You know, you can, you can go after it, and when you go after it, you go after it completely. But there has to be a point to where you keep that separation between you and them. Because if you don't, 
they become part of you. And it just, you know, it, it hurts. So. Yeah, the, the, it, it is, and it is, it's the blending. If you look at a, like a chart of spirit, soul, and body, you know, they all overlap. And it's that part in there. So there is a soulish, there is a spiritual, there is a, even a physical aspect because you see the physical condition or whatever it is and you relate to it. But remember too, sympathy will lead you into this faster than compassion will. Compassion always speaks from a, from a position of strength to help you out. But sympathy enters in. And that's where... See, but in the church, especially when I started, I was taught to enter in with them. Isn't that right? But you can't. Because sympathy means to actually enter in. We're not told to have sympathy. We're told to have compassion. Compassion always stands on the shore and pulls you out. Sympathy wades into the water and we will probably get drowned with the other person that's actually drowning. That's, so there has to be a difference where you don't enter in. You always have to... And this is a... Well, getting back to the new creation aspect, you always have to remember where you're coming from. You are ministering from, from a position of victory as a, and a position as a son of God, setting the captives free. You're doing just what your big brother did. He's already set them free, declared them free. Now you're enforcing the victory. See? So you're, you're not him, but you are a son. Right? Because it says that he would be the firstborn of many brethren and that he, would take, bring, that he would bring many brethren to glory. Right? So we are to many sons to glory. So we are... We are to walk just like him and to enter into that place, but we're always supposed to remember that we're not them. Right? That's the difference. And where, you, where a lot of the problems come from is whenever you start to relate to them. See, a lot of people have that. They'll say, well, like, like we were talking about with drugs and things, I've never done drugs. So it's very hard for me to relate to people with drug problems. Now, I can set them free. We've seen it. I've done it. Bam, blast the thing. But as far as relating to it, I can't relate to it. You know, I have, in my, and I probably really shouldn't say it this way because I don't want you to think this relates on you in any degree, right? I always saw drinking, smoking, uh, drugs as a symptom of a inherent weakness. That's the way I saw it, okay? So... I always saw that as being weak in some area. If you had an addiction, it was a weakness. See, that's the way I saw it. <clears throat> and so, from the time, you know, I guess I was about nine, I guess, somewhere through there. From that time on, I have hated weakness. That's when that was right when I got in martial arts. And I started training, and the martial arts didn't give me that hatred for it. The hatred for it got me into the martial arts. And I started building up myself so that I had was trying to build up any weaknesses that I had or felt or perceived and trying to make them into strengths. And so alcohol and cigarettes and you know drugs and stuff, it was never even, I mean, I vow, made a vow to God when I was nine at that time that I would never do any of those things, which because I made that vow, that helped give me the strength not to do it. But I also hated the weakness that I thought caused those things. So it really, I'm telling you, I've never struggled with any of those things. I mean, it's never even really been a serious temptation. And I had people buy drinks and put it on my table when I was at the nightclubs and stuff, and they'd put it out there, and, you know, I'd, you know, thanks a lot, and then I'd go over and take it back and say, you know, this is a bourbon and Coke, just give me a Coke. And they would take it back and give me a Coke. You know, and, <clears throat> but it was, the, the difference is whenever I saw that in people, see, I didn't have to do drugs. I couldn't relate to them in drugs, but I could relate to them in bondage, because I've been in bondage. You see? Bondage is bondage. Sin is bondage. So you don't have to do the thing to relate to it. Because if that's true, Jesus can't relate to you. Right? Because he didn't, he didn't do any of those things. But he really did. He can relate. So the, you have to be able to relate to people, but not enter in with them. And the problem is many times if you see yourself in them, you can relate to them, and that's really what draws you in. Because now you're also in sympathy and the thing that maybe you were involved in the same thing and now you're afraid you're going to get back into it. So you go into it and you're trying to get them free. And really what you're doing is you're seeing yourself you're trying to get free. And when you do that, it connects. 
And there has to be a total disconnect at some point. At some point, you have to remember you're walking on God's side. And See, if somebody gets hold this tape, they can take it and butcher it a little bit and make it sound like I'm saying what I'm not saying. But you always have to remember that as you walk in this earth as a Christian, as a son of the living God, that you're walking on the God side and not the human side. Right? The human side is full of weakness, is full of destruction and sorrow and all that kind of stuff, but the God side is full of victory and strength and all these things. And now, that's, and the problem with this is you're walking on, a, on the edge of a cliff. Many people have walked that edge and a lot of them have slipped right over the edge. Because you start ministering in power, you start seeing things, and the more pure you operate in this, the more the temptation of the enemy tries to come to push you over that edge and make you think that you are divine or you believe some stupid doctrine about you are God, you know, in this kind of... And, and people say, well, surely you wouldn't believe that. There's a lot of people out there that do. A lot of cults out there that believe that very thing. Right? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Her eyes, but she's also living with her boyfriend and kids and her intentions of marrying. Mm -hmm. And um, and her eyes are a little better, but not really a lot. Is just, I mean, and I try not to judge her according to her skin because she's a brand new baby Christian. Mm -hmm. She's been witnessing to her, and her mom is witnessing to her, and, and uh, do I keep praying for her there and just let God work the spirit of conviction work on her? What if, if you get her eyes open, she may leave him? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, <laughs> oh, oh, no, sorry. No, sorry. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but, well, you don't sound anything like you look. You know. <laughs> so, so, but um, now I mean, mercy says pray for everybody, and the goodness of God draws people to repentance. Now the problem comes in when people claim to be Christian and yet still living in sin, because the the first step of Christianity is to repent from sin as a whole and then especially specific sins that you're involved in <clears throat> and you know I would say that there's a much deeper problem than her somewhat blindness at this point but I would continue ministering to her uh, if she shows interest you know and like you said maybe she doesn't seem that she's going to uh, leave him at this point but man God, she could wake up in the one morning and, and it could be there. You know, it's kind of like, i got to get out of this. Because sin has a way, especially when you start really starting to try to walk with God and head in that direction. The Holy Spirit has a real good way of just letting the darkness of sin just that you're in, whatever it is, just rush in and cover you to where you almost can't breathe. And you're just like, i got to get out of this. And so, you know, more than anything else, I'd be praying for that. You know, pray. You don't want to just stop and stop your connection so that you have no influence into her life. That's been one of the problems in the church is, you know, it's a sinner, so we've got to stay away like their sin's going to jump on us or something. Jesus was in the middle of them, just didn't partake of what they did. So we need to be able to minister while preaching truth, you know. And, you know, just pray in that direction. Since you know her, you know, that well, then you know where to pray toward these things for their... I mean, she's already claiming to give her heart to God and say, God, she's, she's saying, she's giving you permission here. So just flood, you know, bring truth, bring light, bring, let, let, I mean, he's called the Holy Spirit, the spirit of holiness. So let the holiness of God come upon her to the point where she can see the sin and know what it is. And honestly, a lot of times you don't have to say a word, but, uh, but, you know, preach righteousness. That's it. Just preach and, you know, preach it true. But that, that's why I would go about it. You know, like you say, we don't want to condemn in the sense of blasting her, making her feel like she wants to give up. But we want to make sure that we, she knows we're not condoning how she's living and that it is not right. So, there's a, you know, individual contact with people, it's kind of hard to do that. But whenever you have ongoing contact, it's a little easier to show the balance. So, all right, next. Let's see. Yep. Uh, yep. Number... Next. <laughs> Number two. <clears throat> yeah. In a corporate setting, the church should press the attack until victory is achieved. If a church is having problems with a city committee or department, they should not only win that battle, but they must, must push on until all future battles are also won. 
by causing the spirit controlling the situation to surrender. Do not put up with belligerence from an area spirit. Okay? Don't put up with belligerence from an area spirit. Some little imp in that area that thinks it has some right there, don't put up with it. You blast it, you keep going after it, you exert authority over it, and you make it bow its knees. It must not only surrender, it must bow its knee to the name of Jesus. Take the ground and never give it back. Make the spirit admit that you are the spiritual force of that area. All right? And that's the key right there. Now, here's the problem. If you don't see yourself as the spiritual force of that area, it's going to be real hard for you to convince that devil. So you have to decide. And honestly, I guess, you know, it's kind of funny because every time I come in and do a SWAT, I want to give a prerequisite. Last time I said you should watch the, or should get a hold of the Spiritual Warfare 101 and the PNW Spiritual Warfare. And now with this one, with what I'm saying the last couple of sessions this afternoon, I would say really a prerequisite for what I'm talking about now, to walk in what I'm talking about right now, you need the, the you don't need, I mean, you can get it, God can give it to you. But if you want it the quick and easy way, <laughs> okay, then you could get a hold of the series we got out there called Understanding the New Creation. Because that, that puts everything in place. You know, and we've, we've got so many testimonies off of that of people saying once they got a hold of it and understood it, it changed their spiritual walk. It, it put them on a different plane spiritually. I'm like, really? I want to go back and listen to it. You know? <laughs> so, but it, it's true. You have to understand what was done at the new birth. And when you do that, you will see that you are the spiritual authority there. And you'll start to walk in it. And now, your biggest... See, if you could, if you could be off by yourself... Study this stuff like I'm telling you here, like that series, all alone. Just be by yourself. And then just come into town and walk what you've been learning. It'd be really simple. And you'd come in blasting. But the problem is, while you're learning this and while you're hearing this, you're usually around family and friends and other people and different people and religious people. And the whole time you're gaining this, every time you get around them, they start trying to put you back down rather than letting you walk in it and encouraging you in it. But if you could ever just get a hold of it and then just go out and do it, I guarantee you, it would just blast down doors. Because once you understand really what happened at the new creation, it's over for the enemy. He can't beat you anymore. And I'm not, in that series, I'm not talking about necessarily about healing and deliverance and all that. I'm talking about a new creation that all those things have no claim to. And you can just walk free and you walk clean and the enemy can't touch you. And yet when you walk in, everything happens. You know? And, and you're in charge. So, can't go on this too long. Anyway, take the ground, never give it back. Make that spirit that you believe, admit that you are the spiritual force of that area. Alright? Alright, let's take a break.